Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor. I'm very excited because we have a very special guest today, and she is a certified financial planner. Her name is Kari Polaschik, and she is an amazing financial planner, and she is here today to talk to you about how to take control of your finances in six steps. Six steps, guys. So you put your ears on and listen because she has amazing advice. She's a terrific financial planner and she's here today to share her insight with us. So Kari, tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do. Yeah. Hi, Stacy. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm a financial planner. I've been in the industry since 2007 and I bring my passion for putting people's goals into their financial picture. Um, I do need to start off with a disclosure before we get into the six steps. So uh, bear with me here. This information is intended to be educational and general in nature and does not take into consideration you, the listener's personal circumstances. Therefore, it is not intended to be a specific individualized financial, legal, or tax advice. To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, Consult the appropriate qualified financial prior to making a final decision. I'm sorry, that is a lot of words. So now that we got that out of the way, I am ready to jump into the six steps, if that's okay, Stacey. Oh my God, yeah, I want to hear it. I'm really excited about this. Okay. So, you know, before we kind of get into this, I do want to let you know that I, I truly wish, now as easy as sip, six simple steps sounds, uh, say that fast, um, I wish it were truly that easy. Some of these steps are going to be a little bit of work, um, but I do find that the things that are the most work are often the most, most rewarding and getting yourself set up for a financial future that is exactly what you imagined is one of those things. Um, but I did want to let you know that because there is some work involved. Mm -hmm. So step number one, knowledge is power. You need to find out where you are before you can determine where you're going. So again, this is, is going to be probably the most challenging step and the most work. I mm -hmm. want you to dig up everything, right? So this is what we call a brain dump. I want you to start easy by getting your checking and savings account balances, write those down, type them into Excel or Word or whatever you need to do. And then I want you to move on to maybe your, you know, 401k or your 403b, whatever you have through your employer. If you have plans that are with old employers, I want you to track that down too. Oftentimes people leave their plans with their old employer and don't roll those over or don't know where they are. This is money that you're leaving on the table. You have worked for this money. You have saved for this money. I want you to track it down. You may need to contact the HR department or do some Googling, find the company where it's at, but you can get this information. I promise you can, you're empowered to do it. Um, after the employer sponsored plan, you can move on to you know, IRAs, Roth IRAs, any investments accounts that you have, just, just track the balance for now. We'll get into the more detailed investment options later, but right now we're putting together your personal balance sheet. So I want you to get the balances of all your financial accounts, any annuities, any REITs, any insurance that has a cash balance, anything like that. Um, you can also do non-liquid assets, you know, collectibles, jewelry, things of that nature, and also tangible assets like homes and cars. So the first thing you're going to do is get all your assets and put those again, write it down in Excel, in Word, however you want to do, but you should have the account and the balance. Next, we're going to move on to your liabilities. Ooh, this is the scary part, right? All your debts. So student loans, personal loans, mortgages, lines of credit. I want you to gather all of this. This is the scariest part. And people feel so nervous about getting all their liabilities into one place but I promise you're going to feel better once you have all that information and you know the monster that it is. So the simple equation is assets minus liabilities equals net worth. So you'll put that together on a spreadsheet. Hopefully your assets outweigh your liabilities, but it, if not, at least you know where you're at and you're going to start a plan to work to get that to a better spot. Um, so really, that's step number one. I hope that you find that somewhat easy. 
Um, I started off with one of the hardest pieces. And once you get that together, then we can move on to the other steps. Uh, step number two. All right, you guys ready to have some fun? This <laughs> is my favorite step. So this is goals, right? So I want you to write down all your financial goals and I want you to categorize them short term, mid term and long term, right? So short term, it may be, hey, I want to pay off my student loans and maybe that's a long term goal. Who knows? What are your what's the balance? Um, maybe you want to buy a house. Maybe you want to start saving for your kids college or maybe you just want to start saving for retirement. But I promise you, retirement looks different to every single person. So when you write down retirement, I want you to say, I want to retire in Florida in a condo, or I want to work part time, or I want to start a business, or I want to be retired completely and spend all my time with my grandkids. Whatever it is, I want you to put down your financial goals and as much color as you can add to these goals will help you because you're going to revisit these. When you're yeah. feeling unmotivated down the road, which you will, right? That happens. We all get stalled out. I want you to go back and I want you to say, hey, I have this plan in place and I'm saving and I'm doing these things so that I can retire comfortably, you know, right. with a house in Mexico, or I can really set my kids up for success by paying for their college. These are things that I want you to add as much information as you can. And I want you to write them down. Studies show that you're far more accountable if you write down your goals and if you track them and revisit them. Your goals can change too, right? You might decide, hey, Florida's not for me, or you might decide that, you know, I've chosen to only pay for half of my kid's college or whatever the case may be. You are always welcome to change your goals, but it is important and crucial to capture them. And if you have a spouse or a partner, Share those goals with your spouse and partner. You want to be on the same page. You right. don't want to get to retirement and say, hey, I've decided that we're going to retire in Florida. And your spouse says, I hate Florida. I hate the warm. I want to retire in Montana, right? So you need to be on the same page uh, with your financial goals. That doesn't mean you need to combine finances necessarily, um, but you should be on the same page with your financial goals. Okay. How does that sound, Stacy? Is that what do you think? Easy? Hard? It sounds like, you know, I think I think when you when you hear all this stuff, you get a little overwhelmed. I think what are some of yeah. the ways people can, you know, simplify it? Like, you know, is there like um should people have a journal? Should they keep like, is there a certain like tab or is there certain programs that you recommend? Because I there are great softwares out there that, you know, you can implement all this information and they do all the data analysis and they really keep you on track and they, you know, they kind of show you, you know, where you're at, you know, and where you could be going. Like, what do you suggest, you know, so when you're doing all this, what's the best way that you could do it so you're not overwhelmed it's easy and you can continue so you you do, you know you don't fall behind you know so what what do you suggest yeah stacy that's a great question and a great points there so i always suggest like you said having a journal i have a notebook where i keep track of not necessarily my financial purchases but my financial goals right and keep that have that with your spouse um, I also recommend setting aside a certain amount of time, either daily if you need to, and that maybe be in the beginning. I'm not saying daily sit and revisit your financial goals, but maybe in the beginning for accountability, you say, I'm going to spend 20 minutes today to go over what I purchased, right? And we'll get into that a little bit with the budgeting. Um, yeah. But I do think you should revisit your financial goals and your financial plan at least twice a year. Now, mm -hmm. I spend about a half an hour on Sundays with my partner and we go through, hey, how did this week look? Are we on track? How are things going? Are there any big expenditures coming up? Very mm -hmm. high level, but it keeps us grounded and on the same page. So yes. definitely setting aside some time to make your finances top of mind is important. Now, people get really weird about this, right? So they feel like, oh, this is going to be so stressful and it's going to be so hard. And yes, it might be at first. And my husband was the same way. He did not want to do it. And I said, okay, well, we'll do it with a glass of wine and our favorite snack, right? So on Sundays, we pour a nice glass of wine and we put together like a charcuterie tray and we eat that while we talk about our finances. We don't do that every week anymore. But in the beginning, that was to incentivize us to, hey, this is important and this is for our future and let's get on the same page. 
Um, as far as softwares, oh my gosh, there is so many great tools out there. And there are some that are very complex and very simplistic. So depending on what you're looking for, any number of these can work. So if you're somebody that has a lot of debt and you're worried about how am I going to pay this off? How does this look? What is a plan? You can go to undebtit.com and they will put together, you'll input all your accounts. It's a free system and they will help you come up with a plan to pay off your debts. And if you follow the plan, it'll say, hey, you're going to be debt free as of this time. So you put in your budget. Again, that's something we'll get to later, the budgeting. Yeah. Um, and then you put in your, your liabilities and it'll walk you through how to get there. Um, I am not somebody that says you have to be completely debt free, right? So having a mortgage, having a car loan, those are all normal things. I don't, I don't think you need to pay those off necessarily in a hurry because they usually have a low interest rate. Right. What I am more concerned about is if you're carrying a balance on your credit card and it's 30%, 30% that will eat you alive. So yes. that is debt that I would say dump into the undebted you know, website right. and it'll create a system for you to pay it off. You don't right. need to put your mortgage in there. Your mortgage is fine at 30 years or whatever the case may be. Um, but definitely any of that consumer debt, I would add to that. Uh, for tracking expenses, I love Credit Karma. Again, a free tool to use. It does take a little bit of work to set it up, to add your accounts, to start tracking your expenses, but it does then categorize things for you. And it makes it really easy to say, hey, 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 I have spent way too much money on food this week, or yeah. hey, I need to trim back this area. So there are things that you can do to just, you know, simplify that. Again, not that you have to write down every expense you have, but use a system like that to help you, you know, determine where you're spending your money. And kind of the third system I would recommend, and oftentimes you can find these for free online too, or with your 401k provider, is just a general financial planning. Hey, you're in the right direction. Or, hey, yeah. you need to save more to get to your retirement goals, right? So I know Empower right. has one um, where you input your accounts and the amount you're saving, and it'll calculate and tell you, hey, you need to save you know, $500 more a year or this much a month to kind of get to your financial goals. These are pretty general. Um, I do recommend also meeting with a financial advisor. But if you're just looking for like, hey, where am I at? They can yeah. be really helpful and really great to use. So, yeah, those are kind of the three systems that I recommend. Um, you know, a financial advisor can help you with all three. But if you're really a do-it-yourselfer, all three of those programs are free and very easy to use and are at your disposal. That's great to know. You know what I yeah. noticed? That uh, one of the biggest mistakes that I see people make, and I, you know, I probably am a victim of it myself in my lifetime. One, when you ha you look at it, you're going for a credit card, and you're looking at the, um, the, a financial institution. They're really good. They they have a good reputation. So you sign up to get the credit card, and most people I talk to don't even realize how much interest they're paying until like later on and they're like oh my god it's like 33 percent it's 32 percent oh my god you know but the whole time they they didn't realize you know because you, you know when you're signing up for a credit card you're just looking to get the credit card and a lot of people believe it or not don't look at what the the percentage is and then later on they look back and they're like oh my god i can't believe i'm paying all this interest you know and a yeah. lot of people now, you know, with all the struggling after COVID, there, there are, you know, there's quite a bit of people out there that are struggling. So they pay the minimum. So like you said, they're getting eaten up alive. And the second thing I thought about when you were talking was that, you know, a lot of times people spend, you know, X amount of money on food each month, or they'll spend X amount of money on going out to a restaurant. And you don't realize how much you're spending, you know, for the entire year. You're never, you're never adding up like, you know, little costs. You might spend X amount of money on vitamins and X amount of money on this. And then if you add up the amount of money that you spend for these things that you like, you know, at the end of the year, you know, a lot of times your eyeballs will come out of your head and you're like, oh my God, I spent, you know, $1,200 or $3,000 or $2,000 on this, you know, during the year because everything adds up, you know, but you don't think about it when you're paying in small installments. That's right. And, you know, we live in a culture of consumerism, right? You got to mm -hmm. have everything, you got to buy everything. And so a lot of times people are like, oh, I'll just take out a credit card. 
credit cards are not free money, right? You are paying for it somehow. There's a reason that the Visa Tower is so giant, right? There are people making money off of it. Um, so you need to be aware of what that interest rate is and to determine, can I make the minimums? You know, as a financial advisor, I always recommend paying off your credit card in entirety. If you are somebody that cannot do that, you should not have a credit card, right? If you're living above your means, you need to scale it back, right? You need to determine how to do that. And that's where budgeting becomes important. A credit card, don't get me wrong, is a great tool. It builds credit. It allows you to buy things. You get points. There are really great credit cards out there, but you need to be paying it off in entirety. And if you can't, you need to work on a payment plan for that and then work on a way to not use your credit card, um, right. you know? There are people that use the envelope approach. Again, I'm not a big proponent of this, but mm -hmm. if you're somebody that needs it short term, you know, you get cash and you say, this is my money for the day and this is what I can spend and, you know, make sure it's a reasonable amount. Right. right. Um, but that'll help you in, in saying, I, I can't overspend. I cannot right. do it because it's so easy to swipe a credit card and not think about it until you're paying off that, you know, $2,000 purchase four years later because the interest has eaten you alive. So, yeah. um, you know, something to really think about when using a credit card. Again, great tools just need to be used in the proper way. Right, exactly. Now I'm curious, what's step number four? Okay, well, I'm on step number three. And awesome. I know you want to skip number three. And I know it seems like we've done so much work. And I'm going to tell you step number three is the one that makes people's skin crawl the most. Okay, I'm oh, going to say really? the word. <laughs> budgeting, right? So budgeting, you know, somebody once said it to me and they, they said, don't say budgeting, say expense tracking. So expense tracking, budgeting, whatever you want to say, potato, yeah. potato. Uh, but you need to be aware of where you're spending your money, just as we talked about, right? Where that money is going. And so tracking your expenses, and I you don't have to do this forever. I don't track every expense I make, but I have right. done it in the past to determine, am I within my boundaries? Right. Yeah. And so yeah. I like to get three months worth of spending um, history to determine, Hey, mm -hmm. where am I at? So, you know, rule of thumb is that you should be spending 20 or saving 20%, excuse me. So right away after you get paid, squirrel away 20% of that into, you know, high yield savings account, your 401k and investment account, whatever yeah. we kind of determine is best for you. Um, and then 50% on essentials. So those are day to day living things that you need. And then 30% the remainder should be going to those discretionary sp expenses. So going out to eat, you know, treating yourself to that cup of coffee. I know everybody gives Starbucks a hard time and says, don't have your latte, <laughs> you know, make it at home instead. And you can save this amount of much, you know, a year, but life truly is about balance. So if that cup of coffee at Starbucks is what makes you happy, go for yeah. it. Maybe cut back somewhere else. Right. right. Um, so yeah. just figure out what makes you tick and then follow kind of that guideline to determine, Hey, is my spending in alignment with what it should be? Again, 50% on, you know, crucial expenses, 30% on discretionary and 20% on savings. I will say most people don't save 20%, right? They don't. And it can be really yeah. eye opening when you track your expenses and you're like, wow, I only save 11%. Right. I'm not saying that you have to track it and then wake up tomorrow and jump from 11% to 20%. Um, I liken that to like binge dieting or fad dieting, right? Where you just make a sh total shift overnight that never yeah. sticks, right? So same with finances. I want you to baby step into it. If you're at 11%, try to get to 13% by the end of the month and then see how that goes. And then maybe you're up for a promotion and you get that promotion and it's 5%. And instead yeah. of spending that extra 5%, start saving that extra 5%. There are yeah. things you can do to slowly get yourself to 20% that will make sure you maintain this new financial journey and yeah. not where you just do it for a couple of weeks and then bounce back into old habits and you're where you are before, right? So um, finances are very similar to, right? Like, you know, dieting yeah. and calorie counting and all those things. You don't need to be obsessive, but you need to be aware. And so that's kind of the main thing I preach with budgeting. And there are times when you look at your budget and you're like, 
hey, I'm doing great. There are people that you look at it and they're they're doing fine. And you don't necessarily need to change anything. Maybe you need to change where the money's going, where you're saving it, but maybe right. you're doing a good job at that. Um, yeah. But it's it's really important to categorize things and make yourself aware of where your money's going. Now, for the people that are just like, you know, they have a lot of bills coming in, a lot of expenses, and they're struggling to get that 20%. And, you know, and by the end of the week, they're just making it. They're, you know, they're, they're taking from Peter to pay Paul. They're taking from this account to pay that account, you know, and they want to save that 20%, but they have been a very difficult time because they have so many businesses, you know, like bills to pay. And I, I know a lot of businesses have that problem, you know, small mom and pop businesses, you know, different, you know, types of businesses, they just make it, you know, is there any strategies or tools or like little tips? tips that you can give them, they can work their way because it's not going to happen overnight getting that 20%. But maybe if you if you can give some tips or strategies on how they can build, you know, a, a system where they can actually get to the point where they have a system where they can actually have close to 20% or 20%, you know, in their savings, and they can start building, you know, a retirement or, you know, money in the bank for, you know, a rainy day. Yeah, I agree. There are a lot of people that 20%, I mean, that's a huge number, right? And I find most people are not hitting that. And like you said, it's, it, you know, if you, if you get there and you're like, gosh, I'm only saving 2%, it feels almost impossible to hit that 20% and you're going to become disheartened. Please don't yeah. become disheartened. Write down a financial goal and say, by the end of the year, my goal is to save 4%, Right you can get there. It does not have to be overnight. And any increase, any step you take forward, you are better off for it than if you didn't do anything before. So that's right. where budgeting becomes really important. So if you look at your expenses and you say, hey, I can stop going to Starbucks, if that is something that, you know, or I can stop getting my nails done and I will paint my own nails or you know, these are things you can do and you can cut back and you can really track where you're at and you can say, I'm going to save first. And that's what you should do. So right away after you get paid to determine the amount that you can save and put that away in a, like I said, a retirement account, a high yield savings account somewhere right away so that you don't have that. Because if you have it, you will spend it. I mean, that's just basic psychology, right? If you have money, you will spend it. If you have money in your pocket, it's gone. Um, yeah. And everybody's the same way. Nobody's above that. So right. to save first is truly important. And then to make little tweaks here and there where you can to get yourself. Again, I'm not advocating that it has to be an overnight change. For some people, it may be, but for I would say the majority of the people, it can't be and it won't be. So do what you can a big thing is cash flow. And so this is where the credit card thing comes in because people are just paying the minimums and they can't get by. So kind of the rule of thumb here is to, um, if, you're, if your interest rate is more than you think you can make in the stock market and the stock market, again, I'm not saying the stock market does this every year. I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, but if you think in terms is 7%, right? So if your interest rate on your debt is more than 7%, you should be paying off that debt rather than saving it. So while I advocate for 20% savings, your cash flow might eat you alive if you're at 30% and you're paying $25 on your card, but your interest is $50 a month, right? So that's going to compound and you're just going to end up paying more and more and more. So like I said, the Undebted program does a really good job of calculating what your monthly interest is. Pay at least that, right? Pay at least that and then pay more if you can. So um, put together a plan. And if you're like, I can't save 20%, but I am you know, making my cash flow better by paying off this 30% credit card, then yeah. in the future, once that card is paid off, you will be able to save that because that money will not be going to that credit card anymore. And you can put that in your savings. So it's kind of like walking a fine line, like, hey, should I pay off my debt or should I save this? Again, if the interest rate is you know, upwards of 10%, you've got to pay that off first before you start saving. 
or you can do a mix, right? It doesn't have to be one or the other. You can save 3% and put the rest, you know, maybe 5% of that towards that credit card. You can really work on your budget and it doesn't have to be a one and done, right? This is my budget right. and this is what it is. Maybe you try it one month and it works or it doesn't work or you think you can pay a little bit extra towards that credit card, go ahead and do that. Um, I know when I was paying off my student loans, I would write down every expense I had. And if at the end of the week I had an extra $20, I would pay that off towards my student loans. I would right. take that extra $8, $20, $100, whatever it was, and I would pay that off. Any amount of money that you pay off towards that debt will, will truly help you out. Yeah. And I think we should stress too, I've known so many people that have deferred their student loan payments and they are still paying now their student loans because they incurred so much interest over that time that they deferred it, that they are adults now and it's been over a decade or two and they're still paying their school loans. And some of them have really high school loans, you know, but when yeah. you defer it, you're just like, you're digging yourself in, in a grave basically. Yeah. And, you know, certainly we've maybe done a disservice to the younger generation by, by, you know, increasing the cost of education and also, you know, not making it mandatory, but, you know, encouraging, strongly encouraging people. And without, I don't think, providing people with the education to understand what those financial decisions do. Now, we don't teach finance in high school and generally not in college unless you take financial programs. So right. it seems like, oh, I'll just de defer my loan. I'll just take a, out a credit card to pay for this. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think we've done a good job of educating people of what that actually means and what that will do to your financial future. So, you know, understanding, like you said, very important to understand when you're taking out a credit card, what that interest rate is. And okay, that's fine, 30% if you can pay it off every month. If you can't, again, I would caution you to, to not use that and to you know come up with a, a different solution. Or right. you know maybe short term to get yourself out of a pickle until you build up an emergency savings, right? And so that's right. another thing that we see is, is truly important is having an emergency savings. And that, that kind of goes right into budgeting because when you budget and you say, hey, I need this much to live month to month. Yeah. Then you can say, I need to set aside three to six months, you know, kind of varies mm -hmm. um, worth of monthly expenses into a savings account. I always recommend a high yield savings account. Uh, right now, the interest rates on that are really great. They won't be forever, but having that short term cash reserve where you can tap into it at any time if you need to will make you feel so much better, right? Because your car is gonna break down, right? Your roof is gonna spring a leak. I mean, the, these things absolutely happen. So if you have that emergency bucket, you're still gonna be stressed. I'm not saying you're not gonna be stressed, but you're gonna be yeah. far less stressed than if you're like, gosh, my car is broke down and I truly don't know how I'm gonna pay for this. And now I have to take out a credit card, right? So um, budgeting can help you with all of the things. And I know it's not sexy and it's not great. And whether you call it tracking expenses or budgeting, um, it is work and it is something that you need to do, but it yeah. will, it will, it will be one of the most important things you do in your life, right. Into right. determining where's my money going, how I can be better at it and how I can sell, set myself up to be empowered, to take control of my finances. Right. So Step number three, everybody's least favorite, but but the most important, I will say, is budgeting. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I think people get what you know what I see so many people, they get stressed. When you when you talk about finances and you talk about paying bills, that's when the stress comes in. But if you break it down to these these steps that you're talking about, I think it's really, it, it kind of takes the stress a little off because now you have a strategic plan and you could like little by little, if you, you know, you don't have to do everything in a day. You know, if you start doing this little by little day by day, you know, you start seeing things in front of you and you start seeing actually what's going on. I think that takes the stress off a lot. Yeah. So I think that be absolutely. I meet with people every day and there's so much shame around finances, right? And they come to me and they're so embarrassed or shameful. Um, my mentor, she used to say that finances are as personal as your dirty laundry. Mm -hmm. Totally believe that, right? Would you let your neighbor come into your house and dig through your laundry hamper? 
You right. wouldn't, but that's how finances are. So, um, you know, don't feel shame around it. We do not teach people. We do not pe set people up for success. Listen, I've been in this industry since 2007 and I have a degree in finance and I still learn things about the financial industry all the time, right? You just, every specific situation is different. Every person is different. You don't know the backstory or what they've gone through. Um, so try to remove the shame from it if you can and try to understand that everybody feels this way, right? Everybody comes in and they feel embarrassed about their finances, um, but you don't need to, right? You can, you can yeah. remove that shame by following these steps and getting yourself to a better spot. Yes, I agree a hundred percent. Now, step number four, what's that now? Yeah. So now that you've done the hard work, you got to follow your plan, right? So you've got your budget and you said, okay, I'm currently saving 11%. And I'm going to save it in, you know, here and I'm going to reduce my expenses, excuse me, over time by, you know, purchasing less clothes or, you know, not going to Amazon quite as much. I mean, I have a rule after eight o'clock, I cannot log into Amazon. No online shopping after eight o'clock. It's always a bad decision, right? So yeah. sometimes you have to put those rules into place where these are things right. that you, you can't do. Or, um, you know, I make a list of items that I would like to purchase to update my wardrobe every quarter. And if it's not on the list, I don't buy it. Right. So there are things that, you know, everybody needs to do and everybody should do to control themselves. I also very infrequently go into Target. I order everything for pickup. Because if you go into Target, we all know what happens. You go in for toilet paper, $5, you know, purchase, and you end up $200 later with a bunch of candles, right? So yeah. you need to set parameters and you need to follow those. That's the next thing is you're going to have days where you're just, you're just having a bad day. You just need some relief, right? So set mm -hmm. up something that you can do to treat yourself because you yeah. should treat yourself. So whether it be, hey, I'm having a really bad day and my favorite go-to meal is going to be ordering food from this one restaurant, or I would like to pour myself a nice glass of wine, or I want to relax and get my nails done. Set yeah. yourself up to treat yourself. It is a balance. You can't not have a balance. Whatever treat yourself looks like for you, I want yeah. you to, to do that, but do it sparingly. So it is treating yourself because if you are going every day to Starbucks and getting that, you know, delicious pink drink, um, it's not a treat anymore. It's just something yeah. you do every day. But if you scale back and you do it only occasionally, it becomes a treat and you are setting yourself up better for success. So it's just following your financial plan. And then, like I said, kind of the check-in. So whether it be weekly, whether it be monthly, whether it be daily, checking in to see where you're at and making changes. So, you know, increasing that savings amount by 2% this month, or, you know, paying off that credit card an extra hundred dollars this month, right. you need to be following your financial plan and it will become unmotivating just as everything does. So that's when you go back and you revisit your financial goals and you give yourself a little treat and you look back at the progress you've made too, because that can be a big thing too, to be like, Wow, I used to have six credit cards and now I have four. That should right. feel really good. Don't beat yes. yourself up and say, I still have four credit cards. Look at the progress you've made and the things you have done and understand that there is a way out and yeah. you're just, you're doing your best and you're getting there and it doesn't happen overnight. Nothing happens overnight. 100%. Yeah. I think that. So plays. that's step number four. I was kind just of easy. Say yeah, is it, you know, I was gonna say, you know, when I was young, when I had credit card bills, I was like, to get out of my debt, I just, you know, what I put myself, I gave myself a rule. If I had it, I spent it. If I didn't have it, I didn't spend it. So if I went in a store and I knew I had to pay X, Y, and Z, and I knew I wasn't gonna have enough of cash, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't buy that. Like you said, the reward, you know, yeah. like if I had it and I could spend it. That's when I would spend it. And I got my, I got all my credit card bills out, you know, paid doing that. You know, it took a little while, but I got everything paid when I was younger because I put myself, I gave myself rules. So the rules that you're saying right now, and I followed them, you know, and I was strict with myself. Stacy, that is exactly what I'm saying. That is a perfect example of what you should do is set those rules up for yourself and then follow them. 
And like I said, there are times when it's going to become challenging and there are times when you're going to want, you know, the cheat day or whatever. You can treat yourself. You can have a little, you know, cheat meal, um, but just don't make it a habit because you're just going to revert right back to your old habits and get yourself back into a pickle. Right. So step number five, now that you've kind of laid the groundwork, right? So you're building that house. Now you need to determine where you're going to save, right? So think of this as you're building the house, the bones are in place, and now you're picking out the light fixtures and the flooring and painting the walls. So mm -hmm. now you need to determine where should your money go? I already mm -hmm. mentioned the emergency savings bucket, three to six months of savings, or excuse me, of monthly expenditures should go into that emergency fund. That is absolutely step number one. And that is crucial. Next would be probably contributing to your 401k. And I say probably because it's not always the case for everybody, but right. oftentimes your employer is going to give you a certain percentage match. That's free money. I want you to take advantage of that. So if they match 3%, say, Hey, I'm going to make it a goal to, you know, put my 3% in so I can get that 3% from them as well. So always good to save in a 401k. And then if you have any extra, you can open an investment account. Um, you can contribute to a Roth IRA if you qualify. There are different types of an accounts that you can invest in. So this is when I say it's probably crucial to start meeting with a financial professional, right? So ask friends and family for a recommendation. Um, you can go to the CFP website and it's let's make a plan and find an advisor, but find somebody that you trust. There right. are truly millions of financial advisors out there. We are a dime of a dozen. So I want you to find somebody that you click with, that communicates with you, and that you trust. Those are the right. three most important things for a financial advisor. So often people get, um, you know, they get they get sold because a financial advisor will promise them or assure them that they're yeah. going to get 10, 15 percent return. Um, you know, investments aren't just about return, right? It's about is that risk tolerance appropriate for you? Are those investments appropriate for you? Are they liquid? Maybe they invest you in something and you, and you can't sell out of it for a certain period of time. So I would be careful of the financial advisor that makes recommendations mm -hmm. without hearing about your specific financial situation first and yes. hearing about your risk tolerance. And then it is appropriate for them to make recommendations from there. But they will help you build out an asset allocation. So you can say, hey, I should be invested in 20% fixed income, for example, and 80% equities. But within that equity, you know, bucket, how does that look? Are some long-term uh, large cap, you know, companies, some are midterm, some are international. They will set you up with that allocation. But right. if you're somebody that's kind of a do-it-yourself or truly set it and forget it, there are target date funds that are, are pretty helpful for that too, right? So you would find the year that you anticipate retiring and you would invest in that year target date fund. And what the target date fund does is it rebalances your asset allocation as appropriate and becomes more and more conservative as you get closer and closer to retirement. So that's kind of a nice set it and forget it fund and you know, recommendation we give to people if they just don't know what to invest in or, you know, as a portion of your portfolio, an S&P fund is generally a good purchase too, um, be it an exchange traded fund or a mutual fund. They're low cost. They invest in the S&P and the S&P historically has performed very well over time. Now there will be, you know, losses and it will go up and down. Nobody has a crystal ball and nobody can determine what the stock market is going to do. Right. But you want to invest for the long term. You can't yes. time the market. It just doesn't really make sense and it doesn't work out. And you can't bet on black. So I know there are people out there that say, hey, GameStop or, you know, you know, AMC or Target or Disney or whatever the company may be is going to be the next knock it out of the park. And it might be. I'm not saying it isn't. It might be. But would you would you go into a casino and would you put all your money on black? I hope not. You wouldn't put your life savings. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's doing in the stock market, right? So we encourage you to diversify your portfolio over a number of different things um, because right. it gets hard to understand when the top and the bottom of those stocks are, right? So 
Maybe you buy something and it shoots to $100 a share from $2 a share. And you are like, well, it's going to double again. And then it drops back down to one, right? It's hard to keep track of that. So meeting with a financial advisor to cover your diversification, your asset allocation, what type of an accounts you should invest in to get the um, you know, best bang for your dollar for tax reasons as well. These are all yeah. things that a financial professional can help you with. That's great advice. I like that. And I, I like how you just, you know, you mentioned that you shouldn't put all of it on black because sometimes people do that. You know, they just put yes. all, everything in one specific, air, you know, thing. And, you know, the, the, you know, it doesn't always work out the way you anticipate sometimes. So then what, you know, you know, I'm yeah. maybe be a little bit more open-minded and really think about, like you said, what's best for them, you know, and not always yeah. rely Don't on what- Don't quote me on this, but I believe the statistic is 82% of the returns you get in the stock market are from diversification, investing for the long-term and not moving in and out of the market, meaning moving to cash, moving back into the market. You, you cannot yeah. time the market. So again- Historically speaking, the best thing to do is to say, okay, here is my asset allocation. Here's what I'm going to buy and then invest in the long term. And I've seen people do that, like move it back and forth, back and forth, and they got burned. Yes. You cannot time the market. Even Warren Buffett, he, <laughs> I think, shoots for like 35% or something like that. And yet, don't quote me on that, of timing yeah. of the market. And he's considered the oracle of financial investment. Yeah. So, you know, again, it's also a time factor. Do you want to spend all your time researching market conditions and, oh, I'm in the middle of the meeting, but I got to sell out of my stock because it's dropping or, you know, these yeah. are all things that you need to consider if that's going to be your approach. It is a ton of work. And historically speaking, it doesn't pay off more than investing for the long term. Right, right. Very good point. Very good point. So that's step number five. And I bet you're saying, hey, what's step number six? Because you you feel like it should be done, right? You feel like I should say, hey, now you're invested with your asset allocation. You have your plan. You're, you're revisiting it at twice a year and you're tracking your expenses. What's next? Right. Well, next is what happens when you're busy making plans, right? So life is going to trick you. It's going to throw things at you. And so you right. need to make sure that your plan is safe and secure. Yes. So that means risk management. So, you know, think about it this way. What if your spouse is the main breadwinner and they suddenly pass away? Right. Where are you going to get your income from? What if you be are the breadwinner and you become disabled? Yeah. All of these things can derail your financial plan. So you mm -hmm. need to, you know, work with a financial professional on ensuring that your plan is safe by potentially purchasing life insurance or disability insurance or long-term care insurance. I mean, there's insurance for any number of things and your financial professional can help safeguard your plan by helping you determine what your need is and working with the appropriate product. Um, I also say meet with an estate planning attorney. Now people always say, I, I don't have enough assets or I don't need to do that. But if you think about it this way, you might just need a power of attorney and a healthcare directive, right? So what happens? I mean, this is so morbid, but what happens if you get into a car accident and you're on life support? What are your final wishes, right? How do you want someone to take care? All of these things are truly important to your financial plan. Um, oh, yeah. I've seen too many times where people just assume, hey, my heirs will figure it out or they yeah. know you know, where my assets should go. And people don't know. And it can rip apart families if you don't have a plan in place for your heirs to determine this is what I want my assets to do. These are where I want my things to go. And even people that don't have heirs, I would even say that that's even more crucial Maybe yeah. there's a cause that you feel very, very strongly about and you would like to give, you know, a certain donation to the Animal Humane Society or you want to build in a trust to do certain things. These are all things that an estate planning attorney can help you with to determine what happens with your financial plan after you pass away. So just ensure, you know, step number six is ensuring that everything's in place and that nothing can derail your plan. Because, you know, life will try. I promise you, 
it yeah. will, it's never going to be exactly as you anticipated. So get it, making sure that you have everything in place is the kind of the final step, step number six. And that's so important because I've seen where families have been torn apart because, you know, someone passes and, and, you know, they didn't plan for what's going to happen next and nobody knows and everyone's stressed and everyone's at each other's throat. And then if they have assets, then, you know, you sometimes greed takes a, a toll and into the, uh, into the, uh, the family relationship and that could cause drama. And, you know, you find that, you know, um, you know, a lot of people I find, I don't know if you've seen it too, but there are a lot of people that don't want to plan for the next step of what's going to happen because they are afraid. Oh, it's going to jinx me, you know? Oh, you know, I don't want to think about that, you know, but you have to, right? You do. It's giving your family a gift. If you think about it this way, um, you know, how, how would you feel if you passed away and your assets didn't go as you intended, maybe you have children and they didn't make it to your children. Or right. how would you feel if, you know, maybe you're not married and they didn't go to what you consider your spouse or the person you wanted to, you would yes. feel terrible. And you, you truly don't want to do that to your friends, your family. You, you don't want to do that. So it is yeah. morbid to think about, but you know, death is a part of life. And so you should plan for it accordingly and make mm -hmm. sure that your assets can go as you see fit. I mean, I've seen people fight over teacups, um, <laughs> you know, and people that get a lot of yeah. but Crazy. after you use a loved one, you're not maybe thinking with your right state of mind. Yeah. And so to have that all spelled out, it's yeah. kind of so comforting to know that your family's not going to be fighting and that yeah. your assets are going to go exactly as you want. So again, these are all scary conversations on the onset, right? Pulling right. up all your liabilities, figuring out what's going to happen after death. I mean, these are very heavy, hard conversations. I did promise yeah. this wouldn't be all fun. Um, but you're really going to sleep better after you do these things. I promise yeah. you will feel so much peace of mind after you get this financial plan in place and safeguard it that really, truly, it's it's worth all the work that you put in. Oh, I, I agree with you 100%. I've seen families break up because of finances, you know, because it's such a stressful topic. But if you sit down and you've done these, you do these six steps that you just mentioned, you know, a lot of that stress, you you know what's going to happen. You know, it, and you also know that, okay, if this happens to me, I can do this now. I could do this. I can make this choice, you know. Okay, how do I do this? Okay, all right, let me set some goals up, you know, and, you know, so if you if you really understand it and you take the time to do the six steps that you just talked about, you could really, you know, get a good grasp of what finance is, how you should approach finance in your own life and how you should plan for the future. And once you do those steps, I think it takes a lot off your back because, you know, that is, finance is such a stressful thing. But if you know what you're doing and you know what's ahead and you know what you have, you know, that takes a load off your back. It does. And, you know, life is stressful. It truly is. And so the, you know, the most, the most, what am I trying to say here? The most stress you can remove from yourself as possible by having a plan, whether it be a financial plan or a plan for certain other things. I mean, that will make you just that much more of a carefree person, right? What is not that what we all want to yes. be more carefree? I mean, it's certainly what I want. Um, yeah. So just, just, following these steps and understanding where you're at really will help with your, you know, your future. Yeah. I think these steps are great. I think they're amazing. Now, if you had to take everything you talked about right now and you had to emphasize on a couple of important points, what are some things you'd like the listeners to understand? Yeah. I mean, I think, again, I'm going to say it. Budgeting is so crucial. Um, people think that you can do financial planning without budgeting. I don't think you can. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you why, because even if you're somebody that has it all, you know, you're doing a great job saving, you're doing all the things you need to determine what your expenses are going to look like in retirement. And yes. how do you know that if you don't know what you're spending, how do you know how much to save if you don't know what that looks like? So right. You know, there are people out there that say, ah, oh, budgeting isn't, isn't a real thing. It, yeah, to me, it is. It truly is. And it, it is one of the most crucial things. So again, probably the hardest of the steps, um, but the most crucial. 
I also think understanding where you're at and not beating yourself up, that is something that I really want people to focus on. Because again, I meet with people every day that come in to tell me these things and they say, oh, Kari, and they're so shameful. And it's like, again, remove the shame. What's done is done. The past is the past. All we can do is work for a better future. And now that you know, and now that you're aware, you can do those things. So try not to beat yourself up. And then two, being too um, hard on yourself in that not allowing that balance of life, right? Because you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. I mean, we were just talking about this, right? So while I'm not saying go out and spend your life savings tomorrow, because you're probably going to die next week, I don't think that's going to happen. But I also want you to have that balance of, okay, I am going to treat myself a little bit. I'm going to do it within reason, but I want to live a full, meaningful life. And so I have set up that a goal for me is to go on a girl's weekend every year. And this is my budget for that. And that's how I make it, you know, a reality. So the goals planning and then treating yourself, it's so important because you're going to be able so much more successful if you have those goals and you understand why you're saving and you are giving yourself a little bit of leeway to treat yourself. Right. Exactly. Now you have provide a lot of different services. So what are some of the services that you provide? Yeah. So I do financial planning and I believe strongly in holistic financial planning. So if somebody comes to me and I've had people come to me and they say, oh, I'm interested in a crypto coach, not your gal. If they come to me and they say, I want investment advice, I need to understand who you are and what investment advice you're seeking. I'm not just going to throw out that you should go purchase this next hot stock. Yes. So for me, it is understanding the person and building goals and determining, hey, how can we make this a reality for you? And right. maybe it is a reality, right? Maybe you're saying, I want to you know, travel the world every month. And I say, okay, well, that's not necessarily plausible on your salary, but right. how about you travel the world in two years and here's the savings plan to get us there, Right. So I work with people on creating goals, on, you know, asset allocation, risk tolerance, on implementing their financial plan. We revisit their financial plan. So all of those things I can help you with. Um, other areas like estate planning. Again, I'm not an estate planning attorney. I'm not a CPA, but I can help you with um, getting a financial plan in place. And where can people find you? Yeah, so I have a website, um, www.adaptivefinancialdesign.com. Um, so again, it's meant to be something that works with you. We're adaptive and we're designing your financial future. Uh, feel free to check out my website. You can always book a complimentary meeting with me where we discuss your current financial situation and see if you're a good fit for me as a financial professional. I love it. This has been amazing, Kari. I am like blown away. You have really taken a really complex topic and you really broke it down to a lot of simple steps and feasible steps that people, anybody could really do if they, and it takes time, of course, but you have the, these steps are a great way to get started to having a, 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 a good future, you know, ahead of you and to also have a profitable and prosperous life, you know, and not and to be a little bit worry-free, you know, like you said, carefree. Yeah. So I think this is great. I really thank you for coming on the show. I hope you'll be back and we could talk more about different topics related to this. And I just want to thank you so much for being on the show. This has been amazing. Thank you, Stacy. It was so great to be here and I would love to come back. You have a great day. Thank you so much. Once again, I, I really enjoyed this a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Stacey.